Yes, give it up for all the dads in the room online. Love you, appreciate you, dads in all, all forms. I'm, I'm a dad of four and an adoptive dad of our fifth kid, Max, and so it's a great day. None of them are with me today because they just don't love me that much. Um, we're actually, actually at camp. We were at camp with students from Gateway over, over the last couple of days and the days to come, and man, we've had a great time. So thank you for supporting students and supporting our church because uh, we're seeing so many people, so many young kids just having a great time, learning about Jesus, growing their faith. And uh, so I drove in this morning uh, at 5 a.m. from our campgrounds, uh, and we're having a good time doing this. So happy Father's Day to everybody. This is what I love to do as a dad and a spiritual dad is to lead, lead people. So we, we, we are in this series uh, talking about uh, trust. Trust me if you can. And, and, and last we talked about, uh, Eric led us through a great message talking about trust authority, trust leadership if you can. And today we timed it out just right. And today we're gonna talk about trust relationships if you can. And, and, and what does that look like? And, and like, like Tara said earlier, sometimes we talk about dads and, and it elicits some sort of emotion, some sort of feeling. And, and for some, it's a, it's, a, it's a feeling of pride. It's like, oh, my dad, look what he did. And look who he was and look what he built and the memories you have with him. And for others, it, it, it elicits shame or pain or, or something that, that really didn't, didn't form you in the way you would want to be formed as a child. And, and, I, and, I, and I get that. But we have to be careful as growing adults or young adults because we have to understand the difference between what we call dysfunctional relationships and dysfunctional parenting and dysfunctional families and, and toxic families because every family will have seasons of dysfunction. And every member of every family or every member of every relationship will contribute to dysfunction. Whether you like it or not, it's just the way you're wired. You are not perfect. And it's okay to look at the person next to you and say, you're not perfect. It's totally okay to say that. Because they're not. Now, dysfunction is something you have to absorb. You have to understand. You work through it. You, you, work, you figure out what's not working and you move on. And then there's toxic relationships. And anything that's toxic, you don't want to grow. You don't want to have around. You don't want to propagate. You don't want to have as part of your family culture. But, but we have to understand the difference. So, so for example, it's probably not a good idea to give a child a soda to drink. And we can call that unhealthy or dysfunctional. It's another thing to do this to a child. <laughs> give a child a beer and a cigarette is, is the most toxic thing you can give a child. So it's not a good idea for a soda, but it's definitely not a good idea to do something toxic. And, and yeah, even though the beer and cigarette's not the best thing for a child, we can all agree on that. Or, or, or we can all have family vacations that have fails with them. You ever been on a vacation and everything just fell apart? And you're like, there's got to be a camera somewhere because somebody is recording this because it's going to be on some video show because everything that can, that can go wrong is going wrong. And we've been embarrassed by our parents' actions. One time my dad, we were on vacation. He saw this girl on a beach. She was about my age. I was about 11 years old. And he, my dad's just very gregarious. He talks to everybody. And he says, you're so beautiful. Son, don't you think she's beautiful? And I said, no. He was so embarrassed. He's like, you embarrassed me. I said, you embarrassed me. We do that. That's kind of the, the parent relationship. But then there's being in a toxic position like this. You definitely don't want to be in this position as a child. Whoever this child is, I, I feel so bad, but I wanted to use the picture because it's fine. It's literally a toxic situation. See, in culture of blaming and canceling and pointing the finger, we're challenged to take ownership in Scripture for our relationships and for what they really are. And the goal for today is for most of us to take ownership of our part of a relational dysfunction. You know, months ago we talked about forgiveness. And yes, forgiveness is part of taking ownership. But, but it's also looking back correctly, looking back rightly. I'm 44 years old and sometimes we look back and, and we'll tell stories from 10, 15, 20 years ago. And I remember it differently than the other person. I was with a bunch of uncles and aunts this week. And they're telling stories. And my cousins and I are like, did we grow up in the same family? Because they're telling stories that we didn't see it that way. 
But when we take ownership of our relationships and we try to rebuild trust or re-earn somebody's trust, we have to take ownership of our part. I was reading and doing some research and I came across this, this, this quote by Wayne Muller and uh, he says this about people who've grown up and adults who recognize where they're at and how they grew up as children. He says, adults who were hurt as children inevitably exhibit a peculiar strength, a profound inner wisdom, and a remarkable creativity and insight. And deep within them, just beneath the wound, lies a profound spiritual vitality, a quiet knowing, a way of perceiving what is beautiful and right and true. And since their early experiences were so dark and painful, they have spent much of their lives in search of the gentleness and love and peace they have only imagined in the privacy of their own hearts. And if we're willing to do a little bit of work in our relationships, just below that surface of hurt and just below that wound that seems to be so in your face about your life, Maybe, just maybe, God is up to something just below the surface if we will begin to open up our hearts and lives to what does it mean to reconcile? What does it mean to be in a healthy relationship with other people? And I wanna be clear, family hurt doesn't just happen in our childhood. I want you to know that. One of the most painful things I've seen is walking people through in our church through having to put their their family in in hospice care or putting their older parents in care because it's too much for them and and, and walking them through how to do that respectfully and, and understanding the tension that is felt. But what does it feel like for an older parent who knows they're getting older and to feel like their children have abandoned them? See, it doesn't just happen when you're three and four and five. Relational hurt and pain can happen in any season of your life. And I want you to understand that you can also inflict pain on others in any season of your life. So as we're talking about trust and earning trust, I want you to understand that can happen at any age. When I was a kid, I loved the the poet Shel Silverstein. And so I I remembered this poem and I pulled it up and it was just kind of how I remembered it. And he says this, it's called The Little Boy and the Old Man. So the little boy, sometimes I drop my spoon, said the little old man, I do that too. The little boy whispered, I wet my pants. I do too, laughed the old man. Said the little boy, I often cry. The old man nodded, so do I. For worst of all, said the boy, it seems grown-ups don't pay attention to me. And he felt the warmth of a wrinkled old hand. I know what you mean, said the little old man. See, pain comes in every season of our life if we're going to be in relationship with people. And I don't want to be a downer. I don't, want to, I don't want to be lacking hope. I want us to be realistic that when we are engaging people, there's a beauty and a love and a compassion and a hope. And yet there's also the other side of that. The fact that we are human and they are human. And that's how God created us. And yet God formed this relationship for a reason. In Isaiah 58, God's people are, are crying out to God because they want healing in the land and they want so many things and they're crying out and God corrects his own people in Isaiah 58, like a good father would. I mean, how many of you dads just think everything your kids says is okay? How many of you moms think everything your kids do is okay? And if you think they are okay in everything they do, let's have a conversation afterwards. You're setting yourself up for some major disappointment. And like a good father, God does this in Isaiah 58. And he says, what is good? What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and crowing? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. You humble yourselves by going through a motion of penance, bowing your heads like reeds bending in the wind. You dress in burlap and cover yourselves with ashes. So when the Israelites would do this, it was a way of consecrating, a way of setting themselves aside. They would take off all of the earrings and all the adornment and all the makeup and all the stuff, and they would say, woe is me, woe is me. And they would basically put a potato sack on and ashes to be nothing to try to get God's attention as though that were to get God's attention. Is this what you call fasting? This is what the father is telling his children. Do you really think this will please the Lord? No, this is the kind of fasting I want. 
Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. And lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free. And remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry. And give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them. And this is the one that's a kicker for me. And do not hide from relatives who need your help. Right? When this little tool that is meant for communication sends me a message that somebody wants to communicate with me, he is a blood relative, and I'd rather not communicate with them, I have a decision to make. Am I busy? Do I ignore it? What do I do when those God has charged me to have relationship with have reached out for help and I don't answer? When right here it explicitly says, you want to get my attention? Take care of the people in your life. Now, I understand there are boundary issues. I understand there is this. I, I totally understand. We're talking about an attitude towards relationships. And what is God saying here? He's saying, you sound like a bunch of white no noise and you're making no progress when you cannot love, care for, and work for those right around you, your family, your work family, those that you can make a difference in. That's what you're called to do. That's what you are powerful to do. And why does this matter so much to God? Why does he care about your family dynamic? Why does he care about what you consider family and friends? Why do marriages and parental relationships and legacy, why does this matter to God so much? I don't know, but there are 368 references, 368 references in scripture, not to mention all the family dynamics and stories. It's important to God. So why does God care so much? We're gonna walk through that today. Here's the reasons why God cares so much. One, it is God's design. Relational equity between people is God's design. In Genesis 126, he says, let us make man or humans in our image. He's telling the Godhead that, Jesus, Holy Spirit. He said, let's create human beings in our image. So it wasn't just your likeness, your body as male or female. That's not what Jesus, God's talking about here. What he's saying is, yes, that's part of it, but it's also how we interact with one another. It's the relational equity. It's the, it's the bonds we build with one another that is supposed to reflect who God is. And we build love and we build friendship. We have bonds that should be formed. We learn to honor one another. It's the first scripture with the promise attached to it, honor your father and mother and you will have long life. Like, oh, there's a promise attached because we're supposed to learn honor in relationships. And we learn intimacy and transparency. This is supposed to be an arena and a relationship where we learn dynamics that reflect the heart of God. And I'm so sorry for many of you who maybe weren't afforded the opportunity to live in that little bubble of a family and to be loved and cared for and nurtured. I'm sorry that was not given to you. But as you are growing up and as you are maturing and as I am maturing, it's our responsibility to understand what are we taking forward with us. Our relationships reflect how God designed for us to grow and to breathe in. Number two, it's how God shapes us. It's God's shaping of us. It's the iron sharpening iron, that proverbial phrase that many of us have heard. It's actually in scripture, Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Now some of us were sharpened in a way that we cut everybody around us. We were too sharp. Maybe we were sharp with our tongue. Maybe we were sharp with our fists. Maybe we were sharp with our Maybe we were sharp in one area or another because of our dynamic, and I totally get that. But God does put us in relationships to make each other better. I was talking to a friend of mine a few months ago, and we were talking about a dynamic he's having with one of his kids, one of his teenage boys. And, and uh, you know, we've been friends for a long time. And as we were talking about it, this is one of my good friends, and I looked at him and I said, hey, I think you love this child more than the other one. He started laughing on the phone. I was like, no, I'm being serious. 
you know, your kids always, if you have kids, they're threatening you with that. Like, you love so-and-so more than the other ones. My daughter Bella told me that one time. We, we do have, uh, we do spank in our family. Sorry if that bothers you. It's how we raise our kids in love, and we do a lot of warnings and all the other things. And one time I went to spank her after like 10 warnings, and she was this beautiful girl, and she has these cute cheeks. And, and she looked at me, and she's like, Dad, Dad, why? Why do you only spank the brown child? I say, excuse me? She's like, my three white siblings, you never spank them. I'm like, first of all, that's not true. It's not true. She goes, you spank the brown one more than the white ones. I'm trying not to laugh, right? But I need to show some discipline. And, And I was like, sweetheart, I am for you. She goes, we have to look out for one another. I'm like, she's like four years old. Where's she getting this stuff? But it's how we grow. And so I'm talking to my friend about his family dynamic, how I was sharing the stories of my kids, how they throw that at me. And he's like, no, I don't love one kid over another. A week later, he called me. He's like, I have some issues to work through. Why did I tell you that whole story? Because in our friendship dynamic, one of us had to tell the truth to the other. One of us had to be the iron to sharpen the other, and he's been the iron to sharpen me. And that happens in relationships and dynamics, in friendships, in marriages, with children. My kids continue to sharpen me. I don't always like it that they tell me the truth. Let me have Father's Day and don't give me any feedback today. Just leave me alone and just let me have my one day where I, can't, I can just do everything right. But that's not what families and relationships are for. They're to shape us and to form us like a lump of clay. You know, that's God's desire is that we're this clay that he can always form and shape. And sometimes he uses people, maybe your life group, maybe other relationships to help form you and shape you. Because when we're not formable and malleable and shapeable, God has to then break us down to get back to that form that he wants us to be in. Jeremiah says this in chapter 18. He says, the, 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 the Lord came to me. House of Israel, can't I deal with you like a potter, declares the Lord. Like clay in the potter's hand, so are you in mine, house of Israel. There's a forming that happens in relationship, and it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good. But that's the dynamic that God put us in because it is the design. It is where we are shaped the number three. It's God's desire is passed on. In relationships, God's true desires are passed on. So there's DNA, right? There's your DNA. There's all the things you pass on that are dominant and recessive, all those things, right? So the DNA part, DNA part about about procreation and about, you know, inhabiting the earth and all those kinds of things. But there's also a spiritual DNA that God wants us to pass on. And there's multiple times in scripture, and I didn't want to pull them all up, where God challenges people to say, Bind these thoughts and honoring of God around your neck and show your children what it means to honor God and live out your life in front of me. Why? Because in families, in relationships, we pass on spiritual DNA. And many people, especially at Gateway, you may not have any spiritual DNA. You might be watching at home saying, I don't even know what I'm even watching right now. Is this even a church? It is, because there's spiritual DNA. And I'm sorry, again, that maybe you were in a home where there was no spiritual DNA. Or the spiritual DNA that was given to you, those soft skills about relationships in God, maybe hindered you to knowing who God was. But it's incumbent on you and on me to undo those things. And to relearn what does it mean to know God and to know God in the fullest because God's desire is that in relationships, spiritual DNA is passed on. Now, I understand that many of you were also raised in very strict religious homes. And so you were told, this is what it means to have spiritual DNA. You get to church at this time in the morning and you get on your knees and you pray and then you go to Sunday school and you do this and then maybe you do catechism and, you do, you're, and you're told all those things. And can I tell you something? None of those things are bad things. But if we do all those things, if we do all the classes and we get on our knees and we do all those things, but we don't live a life that is honoring to God, it's all for nothing. Spiritual DNA 
And so when we live out and we model for people, what does it mean to be surrendered to God? What does it mean to love you and to be friends with you and to be married to you and to be your mom and to be your dad, to be your son and to be your daughter, to be those relationships that is honoring God? I get selfish. You know, I, I got dad issues and my dad knows and he's probably watching today. Dad, I got issues and you know it. But this last week, my dad and his brother flew to Puerto Rico and replaced all the windows in my grandma's house and she doesn't even live there anymore. And I said, dad, why are you doing this? He said, because I just want to honor her because one day when she goes to hospice, we've promised her she can come back to her home and I want this home to look the best it's ever looked the day she dies. And I get off the phone, I'm like, I'm a jerk. I maybe would have cleaned the windows. But you replaced all of them? Had a new paint job? He's 70 years old, he's in hot Puerto Rico, and he's sweating it up because he wants to honor, his, he wants to be a good son. That is passing on spiritual DNA. Number four, the design is also because it's God's generosity. God is generous through relationships. It's how he cares for the needs of others. It's where we learn that we are not at the center of life. Did you know that you are not at the center of life? You are not. It's where we take responsibility for one another. And I know all of this talk about the importance of relationship is making us just exhausted. That's why some of us are like, I'm so glad I'm an introvert. I don't need to talk to anybody. My daughter is such, my, my middle daughter is such an introvert. She's like, I don't actually need people, Dad. I'm good all by myself. I have to make her come out of her room to talk to us. I feel like I'm feeding a dog. Like I put her plate out and she comes out and eats it. But guess what I learned? It's not always true. Over the last few weeks, we've had moments of deep relationship and conversation. Because relationships are not usury. They're not meant to consume and throw out. Relationships are meant to pour into and to grow and for us to grow from them as well. And I know it can be exhausting. And too often we build a, a wall around our hearts to protect ourselves because of the world we live in. But when we do that, the same wall that keeps out hurt also keeps out the thing you need for healing. The same hurt you keep out sometimes can keep out the love that God has intended for you to restore your heart and your soul. That is a healthy relationship. And the more we grow to trust God, the more we will be able to trust in life because we know even when we deal with people that are not trustworthy, God can bring out the good in all those things. And I know we're spending a few weeks trying to build up your muscle of trust, but we have to do that as we re-engage the world. We have to build trust. I've been flying a lot the last few weeks because of some family issues and family things we're trying to work through. And I've been on 15 flights in 18 days. Trying to love my uncles and my aunts and my sister and all the dynamics and the loss that we've had in our family. It is not easy. And I'm, I'm, I'm tired. I'm tired. But can I tell you something? You know what keeps me going? is that it's my turn to love on a lot of people. And if I'm not careful, I could build resentment about how much people need me and my wife and my family. But can I tell you something? At some point, we need that same kind of love in return. We invest into our relationships. Now, for a second, wasn't really gonna do this, but I was talking to Eric Bryant, our South Campus pastor, and we, we wanted to have a moment today where we talk specifically, just for a couple minutes, to our married couples. Or those who intend to get married one day and just take some notes and listen. Maybe you have some trust issues with your spouse. What should you do? I'd say be intentional and get help. Marriage is too hard and too important to try to figure it out on your own. I've shared before, my wife and I went through years of counseling early on because we, we got off on the wrong foot. We were kids. We were in our early 20s. We thought it was all gonna fall apart. And we're so glad we reached out for help and we're still staying today 21 years later. But too many couples wait too long before asking for help. And I want you to know something. Asking for help is actually a sign of maturity. Asking for help is a sign maturity. 
So Eric Bryant put together some thoughts that I thought were really good about marriage and what's happening in our culture today in marriage. When should you ask for help? In case you're wondering as a married couple, or maybe you're engaged, or you're, you're, you have a significant other, you're talking about marriage and what this looks like. When should you ask for help when you don't even like your spouse? Now, some of you are like, well, that's kind of every day. No, when you have this deep resentment against the person that you're living life with, you need to ask for help. How about this? When you've gone for an extended time without being physically intimate as a married couple, we are called to be in bond relationship emotionally, physically, spiritually with one another. And when you abandon that, sometimes we don't understand what we're putting on the other person. You ask for help when you don't want to be physically intimate with your partner. How about this? When you're struggling to forgive your spouse for whatever sins they've committed. I'm not saying it doesn't warrant for you to be upset. That's not what Eric's saying when he put this list together. What he's saying is when you're wrestling through unforgiveness and you cannot forgive, ask for help. Why? Because bitterness will set in. And it creates doubt in your mind about the relationship. How about this one? When you're feeling drawn to another person that is not your spouse. Another person who is not your spouse. You ask for help. You gotta be honest. When the only thing that binds you together is your kids. When the only thing you have going for your marriage is your kids, you gotta ask for help. Get proactive. How about when your marriage feels more like roommates or business partners? You ask for help. And where do, you, where do you go for help? I mean, we talk about it all the time, and I know it goes in, in one ear, out the other, but we have community groups and life groups and support groups and classes. There's so many outlets. There's no reason for you to try to work out your relationship and its dysfunction or toxicity all by yourself. There's no need for that. There's a place here. There are people here who want to engage with you. How about make... Make Sundays a priority for you. That one time you can agree that you're gonna to grow together hearing scripture, worshiping God. Make it a priority for you and your relationship. How about this? See a counselor. Most counselors actually take insurance nowadays. Find somebody to help you. And I know that's super practical. But if we're not careful and we don't take the emotion of our relationship and the dysfunction of our relationship, the toxicity of our relationship, and try to make it functional, it doesn't work. We live off of the emotion. We get drunk on the emotion. We get drunk on the anger. We get drunk on the, on the frustration and we can't even think straight anymore. And when we begin to abandon relationships, we're abandoning God's design for how you are to function and grow as a man, as a woman, as a parent, as a child, as an aunt or an uncle, a great grandparent, God's design is that we would grow in relationships. Now, what about the rest of us? Those of us who maybe are single or maybe we're younger, we're not thinking about marriage. Maybe we've, we've done the whole marriage thing. We're, we're good not being married the rest of our lives. How about the rest of us as a church? What are we called to do? How can we grow our relationship muscle in the days and weeks to come? You heard it last week, and I really want to take a minute to really emphasize this. We are doing something crazy. I don't think it's actually crazy. I think it actually goes along the, the lines here at what we do at Gateway. We've decided that on July 4th, at all of our campuses, we're gonna take that weekend and we're gonna ask you to not come to a church building and attend a church building. We're gonna ask you to be the church that God intended for us to be. To be in relationship. So what does that mean? It means if you show up on July 4th at any of our locations, we will not be there because the church has left the building. The church has left the building. Because I want to tell you something. You are the church. You are God's extension of love and forgiveness and hope. You, God has called you, desires to use you. You are healing agents in your family, in your community, in your neighborhood, in your club, at work, whatever, however you do life. God has called you to be a healing agent. So we're going to close the buildings down. We're going to pre-record a message. We're gonna have worship, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be amazing. It's gonna be ready on Friday, July the 2nd, all the way through the weekend. 
for you to watch it at any point. So if you're on the lake with your friends, gather them around. If you're having a barbecue, gather people around. If you're gonna be all by yourself, invite some people over. Have an intentional plan of what to do. And let me be very clear. We're not off on Sunday, July 4th. We're actually on on Sunday, July 4th. We're gonna be the church of Jesus Christ. We're gonna love people wherever we are. And we're gonna love everyone life by life. How do I know that? Because wherever you are is where Jesus is. And wherever you are, God's called you to love them. And you're like, well, I don't know what to say. Make them a burger. Be hands and feet. I don't know what to do. If it's legal, pop some fireworks. If it's not legal, pop some fireworks. <laughs> but that weekend, you got two weeks. I want you to think about what can you do in your neighborhood? What can you do for the people around you? What is it that can make a difference? How can people be seen around you? In my neighborhood, we're trying to hang out with people. I was just trying to hang out with my neighbor and he put his house on the market. I don't think it worked. He's going for the money. So Libby and I were at the pool the other day and we're just hanging out with people in our neighborhood and we're thinking through, how can we make a difference in our neighborhood? Not just that one time, but week in and week out. How can we build this relational muscle to truly be what God wired us to be, how God wired us to be, God's intention for relationships, not only my marriage and my kids, my friendships, my neighbors. You are more powerful than you understand. God wants to use you in the simplest ways. And you don't know how your life can make a difference in other people. So two weeks from now, the church has left the building and it's in your house. You can still watch on Sunday morning at 9.15, 11.15 if you like, but it'll be ready to stream on Friday night. Get some people together. Have a great time. The message is gonna be kind of fun and lighthearted. How do I know? I'm the one doing it, all right? So if that keeps you from watching it, I'm sorry. At least watch the worship. We're gonna have a great time. We're not off on Sunday, July 4th. We're on practicing the very things that we're talking about in this series. Being Jesus and the church, wherever we are. There's so many things that you can do. Don't get blinded by, oh, I don't know what to do, I'm lost. Email somebody at our church. You email me, what are some ideas that you're gonna do? We will help you figure it out. Let's be Jesus. And if you wanna have a gathering with other people, people who are like you, maybe people you wanna get to know people. I met three new people this morning who are new to Gateway. You wanna meet other people? Go to our website. There's a link for you to get on to, to connect with other people who want to get to know others here at our local church. Be in relationship that weekend. Not just with your boat, not just on vacation, with other people. That is God's design. I'm gonna close with this. Um, I don't normally wear shirts like this, but uh, this shirt's been in my closet for 20 years. And uh, uh, in, in my culture, our ethnicity, this is called the Guayabera. And uh, in different parts of, 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 the, of the Latin world, they, they look a little bit different. So Mexican Guayaberas look a little bit different. You go to South America, they look a little bit different. This one's, this one's a Puerto Rican one. And it's my, my grandfather's Guayabera. And I told a story a few months ago about my dad and my grandpa. And my grandpa was... Um, Short little, short little white guy, blonde hair, blue eyes, and he loved black women. All 19 of them and his 36 children. And my dad was a product of a one night stand and was never raised with his dad. And all this animosity about relationships and what it meant to not have a father. And I shared about how they forgave one another and my dad actually introduced my grandfather to Jesus. It was beautiful. This was all before I was born. But about 20 years ago, I had just become a father, and I get the call from my dad that my grandfather passed away. So we fly to Puerto Rico, and I, and I take my son, my baby son, with me. He had never met my grandfather, but he looked like my grandfather. My son was very light-complected with blue eyes and blonde hair. When he was born, I looked at my wife, and I said, tell me the truth. It's okay, babe. I will raise him. I will pay for it. That's fine. She goes, no, you dummy. It looks like your grandpa. Oh, that's right. It looks like my grandpa. And so we're in Puerto Rico. And my grandfather had, he was a wealthy guy. With 36 kids, didn't go around too much. 
And as everybody's in the downstairs of the house talking about his estate, who's gonna get what, who's gonna do what, my father took us three boys, my two brothers and I and my son, four boys, to my grandpa's room. And he said, you can take one item, whatever you want, and for something that, that you can take home that reminds you of your abuelo. My dad took his Bible, all the markings and all the notes, and it's a treasure for my dad. And my brothers were looking for stuff. And you gotta know, I had a, I, I, I grew up hating guayabetas. My dad would buy them for me growing up. I was like, I don't wanna, I don't wanna wear that. It was the tension of growing up in America. I don't want to wear something that shows that I'm from. All that tension. And yet, I went straight to the closet. And it was the first thing I saw, and I picked it out. So I'm wearing it today in honor of my grandfather, in honor of you, Dad, as you're watching. But you want to know why I'm honoring them? Because I got to see two grown men who had 22 years of toxicity and dysfunction and hurt and abandonment and I saw two grown men grow to love each other. I saw two grown men who built a bridge for the next generation. My dad did the work. He was abandoned, not raised by his father, but my dad did the work so that I could respect my grandfather, so that I could have a relationship with my grandfather. And my grandfather did the work to not be the same man. So my brothers and I get to see him as a hero. We get to see him as Jesus saw him. We get to see him as a Christ follower. We get to see him as whole and be everything we wanted him to be. And now my son, every once in a while, he'll break out the Y of and he'll put it on to remember his great-grandfather that he never met because somebody did the work of standing in the gap and saying, I know it was dysfunctional and I know it was broken and I know there was no trust. But I also know that we serve a God who can heal relationships so today I honor my mom my dad and my, and my grandfather for doing the work of rebuilding what a family and a relationship should look like so that I could use that for my children and maybe you're the first one who's going to do the hard work of building that trust and maybe you're the first one who's got to put those boundaries and really work at it but what you are going to give your future children and grandchildren is a spiritual DNA of reconciliation, the same thing we all desire. Let me pray for us today. God, I know this subject can be really tough. God, I know as we talk about relationships, it, it does trigger emotion and sentiment. And for those of us who had a great model of relationships, God, help us to do the same work our parents or grandparents did so that we can give that to the next generation. And those of us who were not modeled that, those of us who were given nothing, those of us who had to start from scratch, those of us who are trying to figure it out now, God, give us the grace to stand with you, to trust you, to know that you are with us, to know that we are no longer five or six or seven years old, that we are your sons and daughters and you are calling us to a ministry of reconciling relationship, the very thing you intended for us to have. And if we can trust you, then we can learn to grow and trust others. Every heart that's broken today, every heart that's asking, how do I move forward? I ask God that you would give them wisdom to know how to move forward and enough wisdom to ask for help. It's in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen.